the safeguarding crisis at Soul Survivor deepens. We have a vicar who just won't quit because the Holy Spirit hasn't told him to, even though his church has. And Justin Welby is one of the most influential people shaping Britain's progressive politics. Who knew? Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Rev Dan and this is Rev Dan's Roundup where I look at some of the Christian news that is going on both in the Church of England and around the world. The first bit of news to bring you is quite a big bit of news. The ongoing crisis of safeguarding concerning sole survivor. Not only has Mike Pedavacci, who is the centre of the focus of the investigation, been suspended, but now um, Andy Croft, who was leading sole survivor, uh, has been suspended along with another assistant pastor called Ali Martin. The Church Times leads with the headline, Soul Survivor suspends two pastors over handling of Mike Pilavachi allegations. So these two vicars have been suspended. It seems the article says after receiving new information from the National Safeguarding Team, uh, investigating into my, Mike Pellevacci, the non-staff trustees of Soul Survivor Watford had decided to spend two members of staff under HR process. Um, the information submitted to the investigation relates to the concerns over handling of allegations that were raised before the uh, National Safeguarding Team investigation had begun. So th this is not good news at all. Um, it seems the suspension, the suspension is a reaction to something potentially quite serious. They knew of allegations, it so seems, and now they've been suspended pending probably investigation into them and how they handled the knowledge that something wasn't quite right. Perhaps that they've been directly told of certain things that were happening but never pass it on to the safeguarding team both in Soul Survivor and in also um, the, the diocese and the diocese safeguarding team. So now these two uh, pastors, vicars have been suspended. It's a big thing because Andy Croft was leading uh, Soul Survivor. So now you're taking the leader out, you take an assistant uh, pastor, they say, here out. Um, and now um, the person leading the group, uh, Reverend John Stevens, is a non-stipendary um, who was ordained in 2020. So he's now leading this massive church. Uh, just if he's in 2020, well, I don't even think he's finished his curacy in that sense. He's, he might be still training. Uh, but he's been um, a part of the church family for 25 years and worked for them since 2015 so he knows the church but uh big big uh thing to step into especially as he's training but um it's a really sad story of what's coming out of soul survivor i said in a previous video i'm not going to really comment on uh the allegations until we have concrete uh evidence of what actually happen i don't think that's fair but you know we have to react to the news that is coming out and with two people and senior people in the church being suspended for as they say information that was related to the handling of allegations um is a, a big thing and just pray for all that involved pray for the victims, the potential victims, and uh, the church itself. And, and people also who came to faith through this church, that's gonna really rock some people's faith. So unfortunately, continuing with safeguarding, um, Christian Today reports with this headline, Church of England promises improvements to abuse support scheme after criticism. So the Church of England is, has come under heavy criticism and I've reported on this twice before I think now, there's an independent safeguarding uh, board that's been set up uh, to look at the safeguarding 
uh, practices of the Church of England historically and make recommendations, but the Church of England aren't moving as quickly on this. It seems like the ISB, the Independent Safeguarding Board, will will go public with things, you know, uh, shame the Church of England and get in, into getting things done because it keeps ending up in the, in the Christian press. So this article talks about the financial support scheme for clergy abuse survivors. Um, the, the review highlighted the experience of one man only named Mr X who was leave, fe, left feeling suicidal after accessing the scheme. Uh, the ISB said the church needed to take a trauma-informed approach and act with urgency on his case um, and probably mem- many like this person's cases so they come forward but actually in going on to the scheme it's it's obviously made things worse for this person um the isb said the church of england failed to implement uh, recommendation seven with the inspect within the expected time scale um so they said this is what you need to do and it hasn't been done uh, it says the action is now significantly overdue and obviously it's affecting people and there are people behind so you've got processes and people in response to this the director of safeguarding said that work had already started on some of the recommendation prior to the view publications um that there are plans to increase staff in order to shorten waiting times improve accessibility and streamline the process of applying on recommendation seven we have been making every effort to set up a case management group meeting it gets stuck into meetings, doesn't it? That's a problem. Um, he says, I've been working with colleagues across the church, including ongoing communication with Mr. X and his advocate. Try to resolve this issue and we'll continue with these efforts. So it seems like things are moving forward, but not as quickly enough as possible. The trouble with this safe kind of story in the Church of England is um, it keep continuing and it just needs to be sorted because... It's a complex thing when you haven't got the staff and they've got so many things coming forward in the safeguard and obviously in the Church of England it seems pretty dire uh, because there's just so much to change and there's a lot to implement. But at the end of the day, there's lots of people who have already been traumatised by uh, being abused by Church of England priests and other people in the Church of England, I guess. And this just needs sorting out. I don't want to report i hope i hope i don't have to report on this again i hope they can just get this sorted out because really this this really is about people at the end of the day and their trauma uh, continuing so the church of england have appointed a new director of ministry the reverend canon nicholas mckee um he's going to come in and uh, be a director of ministry for the church of england it's interesting i bring this story because i don't know what this is about I, I on a, an evangelical group i'm on uh, it says this is a great appointment he's a good guy i'm sure that he is and he's going to do great things but down at parish level i don't know what a director of ministry does the church of england doesn't work like a um, a business where you've got head office and they say stuff and then we have to implement it um, even at diocesan level so this is church of england so at the level of the diocese you know they they'll have people but we never see them they never contact us because it's kind of like not top down if we they're there to be resourced in that way i think that you know that's where it's worked hardly use the diocese for that uh we'll use other local churches or the knowledge within our church so um i don't know how this works but the church of england has uh, got a new director of ministry he says, I'm looking forward to becoming director of ministry and working in partnership with colleagues across the country so that together we can share the faith of G- in Jesus Christ with the renewed simplicity, humility and boldness. I am passionate about developing the support we offer to people from all backgrounds and traditions to explore God's call on their lives together with how we form, deploy, deploy and resource uh, them for long life mission and ministry. And, and, and I'm sure this works and I'm sure this it comes down maybe it's a church of England thing and it goes down to diocese level and and it influences the diocese and we really do um need something um a real injection of how we live out our faith and live out our calling and and so hopefully this would um this new director and 
I think he's a good evangelical will come in and do that. How we'll see it down at parish level, I don't know, but I'm I'm open to be educated on this and and uh, how how all this works. So last week I brought you the three stories about the killing of the pastor and his wife in Nigeria, uh, the Christian in Pakistan who was convicted uh, for his faith, and the two-year-old child in North Korea who will be serving a life sentence because his parents had a bible of their parents I don't know if it's a he or she picking up on the story of this Anglican Pakistani um, he is now being reported that being to court he's going to be hanged for blasphemy um, he's either 19 or 22 uh, not sure of his age he's been uh, sentenced for blasphemy um, they're saying that he kept blasphemous images of the Prophet Muhammad in his cell phone and shared them with others via WhatsApp. Um, this goes back to 2019 and it involves his cousin as well. Um, the prosecution, this is this is quite scary, the prosecution could not find witnesses ready to state that no men had shared blasphemous images with them, um, although his cousin says he did. Um, the decision is based on forensic expertise which conclude that Noman's images were in his cell phone and shared via WhatsApp. Noman's lawyers, however, observes that the cell phone has been in the possession for, of the police for almost three years and can have easily be tampered with. Pray for this young man. Pray uh, that um, he will not uh, be hanged or, or, or persecuted for his faith. Pray for his family uh, and his friends. And that if it goes through, and it could easily go through in a place like Pakistan, that um, that he will be a, a witness in his death uh, to those around him, to Jesus. So this is an interesting one. The New Statesman, which is a magazine in the in England, has listed fifty of the most influential uh, people on the left, meaning the left in politics. Anglican Inc. lead with the New Statesman's left power list. The 50 most influential people shaping Britain's progressive politics. Um, and Justin Welby comes in at number 27, uh, putting him above some people in Labour in the <coughs> government, such as Jeremy Corbyn, who's at number 29, David Lammy, Shadow Foreign Secretary, who's at number 33, Yvette Cooper, Shadow Home Secretary, at number 36. Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister, at number 37. Marcus Rashford, footballer and campaigner, uh, number 42. Uh, so Justin Welby has got in at number 27. And it says that Justin Welby, when the Conservatives returned to power in 2010, polls suggest nearly half of all of Church of England members supported him. But the Archbishop of Canterbury has spent the last decade as a bold critic of the central tenets of the Tory policy. Welby, who's 67, an old Etonian, condemned austerity as a policy of crushing the weak and called for the end of universal credit. In a speech to the Trade Union Congress, he described the gig economy, which has thrived under Tory rule, as the incarnation of an ancient evil. He has repeatedly defended refugee rights and in a House of Lords debate described the Sunak government's illegal migration bill as morally unacceptable. The church membership is in deep decline, at least in Britain, but Welby still commands both a sizable congregation of 600,000 and a position in the House of Lords. Like his predecessor, Rowan Williams, a former New Statesman guest editor, he seems content in the role of medicine priest. So I don't know if uh, Welby is truly left or not, but uh, it's interesting that uh, it's come out that he is one of the most, well, in the top 30, the most influential leftist in England at the moment. Moving on to a vicar who won't quit. The this got into the Telegraph. Vicar rejects parishioners' request to quit because he is guided by the Holy Spirit. So this vicar, Father Oliver Learmont, has been in position for five years um, in a place called Steeple Ashton in Wiltshire. He was subjected to a no-confidence vote at the annual parish church meeting this vote holds it it just shows it doesn't mean anything um 
but he is staying where he is. He's um, not leaving, he says, until the Holy Spirit tells me to go, I'm going to stay there. He's been there for five years. He's high church. The church don't like his high churchmanship style. Um, the the last remaining PC, uh, church uh, warden who's been church warden for 20 years is quitting. The, the treasurer is quitting. The church uh, P PCC secretary is quitting uh, to try push him out. And they're, basically they're saying it doesn't fit. What's interesting about this is that you go through a whole process to appoint a vicar. Um, you, you put out a parish profile saying who you are. You, as a vicar, you apply, you go through an interview, which could last for a couple of days, and then you get offered. So I don't know where and how uh, they didn't see that this guy's uh, theology, uh, his ecclesiology, uh, it says here, um, the Christian ecclesiology, liturgy and theology. Um, I don't know how they didn't pick up on this anyway. This um, church has never had someone that they call father in for quite a few years, it says. And uh, he is uh, not going to go. He says, uh, a parishioner who attended the parish meeting last month said, Father Oliver was difficult to hear as he spoke quietly. He did not have a microphone, but replied that he did not respond to ultimatums. A vote of no confidence in the vicar was then proposed. The second did with about around 41 people present. It understood that all of the parishioners, save for a couple who abstained, voted for him to go. And when he said that it was on the agenda and uh, that he wasn't going to respond to the vote of no confidence, that he wasn't going to leave, at that, he told he told the he told Father Oliver replied that he would not go and that if anyone didn't like it they could leave. <laughs> Loved to have been at the mean meeting. At this point there was a general exodus um, and that was briefly halted by a clearly shocked rural dean who had tried to steady matters to no avail. Most people left the church to have the meeting continue at a bare bones PCC committee. Um, it's you know, if the rural dean's there, they know there's there's problems already, and it and it really is a sad, sad situation, um, when a an incumbent and the church cannot see to eye to eye. Uh, like I said, I don't know how he got offered the role, um, but the consequences are now there. He's not going. He's staying in post. The church is failing. It's it's just not good. We just need to pray both for that incumbent, his family and that church. And just finishing on good news as always, because some of the news is, can be quite, oh, um, the Christian today leads with over 4,000 people baptized at California beach during historic baptized SoCal event. So uh, on Pentecost Sunday as part of revival, event organised uh, by several congregations um, around 300 churches come to Pirates Cove Beach under the banner of the event Baptized Soka with a record number 4,166 people being baptised which is absolutely fantastic I don't know if this is the uh, the place where they um, Calvary Chapel were baptised and I'm, I'm not quite sure sounds quite familiar uh, but isn't it great that so many people come to baptise uh, part revival uh, event I don't, I don't know if they're trying to stir up revival or, or they were just saying that but imagine on the beach and 4,166 people are getting baptised what a celebration of people publicly showing they're coming to Christ and let's pray that there is revival and let's pray that we can do something like that in the Church of England I, <laughs> you can only do it in the summer on a very very nice warm summer's day after the sun's been out for a good week or two to warm up the sea around here but uh for those who really would love to get baptized it'd be great to go down to the seaside to baptize over four thousand people that's what we need we need revival in the church of england so join me on tuesday as i dig deeper into one of the stories um and every month now i do a live stream on the first sunday of the month at 8 p.m uh, next month I will be looking at what's going to happen at General Synod with the Living and Loving Faith process 
and other stuff open to questions and to chat so join me then